Well, thank you very much for, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about uh, the current global economic crisis uh, and uh, some recipes, some, some pre uh, 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 views about what we ought to uh, do about it. And in doing that, what I want to do is illustrate uh, the use of, of uh, new models that I think ha may be useful in trying to understand uh, the nature of the crisis that we're going through. So what I'm going to do in this talk is begin with a, a, a diagnosis, of, of my diagnosis of, of what went wrong, and then a discussion of some of the prescriptions that follow, follow remedies that follow almost directly from that diagnosis. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about one particular aspect of uh, the crisis was the rapid spread of the crisis, uh, the, how w problems in one financial institution in one country spread to problems in other financial institutions in other countries. And I'll talk a little bit about the uh, way previous models didn't really deal adequately, previous macroeconomic models it didn't really deal adequately with this problem. Uh, I've been told I shouldn't say too much negative about macro, uh, modern uh, economics, so I'll contain uh, my remark negative remarks about economic theory to uh, just a few slides uh, before concluding. Um, well, uh, I don't think I have to tell any of you here or in the United States uh, that we are in the midst of, of a, a very uh, long uh, and, and uh, uh, deep uh, economic downturn. Uh, it's still in, uh, in the United States the case that almost one out of six workers who would like a full-time job can't get one. Uh, unemployment uh, in Europe uh, is uh, comparably, almost comparably high. Well, if we think about the, the current situation, uh, I think we have to realize that before the crisis, that is to say before 2008, the U.S. and to a large extent the global economy was in a sense sick. I say that because in a sense it was what was going on, with the seeming prosperity was based on a real estate bubble. Uh, the largest bubble, of course, was the United States, but Spain and other countries had their bubbles. Those bubbles led to a consumption, the, the, those led to a consumption boom. And the nature the, uh, uh, of, of, of that bubble, the extent of the artificial support, the artificial support that the economy was, was receiving is illustrated by the fact that uh, approximately, the bottom 80% of Americans were consuming roughly 110% of their income. Now, you don't have to have a PhD to figure out that uh, that's probably not sustainable. Uh, you can't consume 110% of your income year after year. And as one of uh, my predecessors as chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors in the United States once said, uh, that which is not sustainable won't be sustained. Uh, and uh, this particular uh, pattern was not sustained. Well, one of the important implications of this is, you know, every once in a while you hear rumors, uh, hope statements from the Fed or from the administration that the American consumer is coming back. Well, that's probably not going to happen. The savings rate in the United States before the crisis was zero. Uh, that's not likely to happen again. It was a basis of an enormous irresponsibility, bad banking practices, and a bubble, uh, a belief that while they were save, consuming 110% of their income, their wealth was going up because of the uh, real estate bubble. So we should realize that even after deleveraging, savings rate is likely to be around 5 6% or higher. And even after the banking system is fully fixed, real estate investment won't return to normal for a long, long time given excess capacity. And that's important because before the crisis, 40% of all investment in the United States was in real estate. 
So that's gone. So there are these two big gaps in our aggregate demand. Consumption, the fact that savings has gone from zero to six, and 6% uh, of GDP, and uh, real estate investment, which was, as I said, 40% of all investment. Well, the problem was that the bubble hit uh, the underlying problems. And worse than that, after it broke, it left in its legacy these, these additional problems of excess capacity and excess leverage. The fundamental mistake in the United States and in most of the other countries was to think that fixing the banking system would suffice. And if you look at what the U.S. government did, it focused on the banking system, didn't worry about mortgages, the suffering of seven million Americans, families have lost their homes. That was sort of uh, collateral damage uh, of our banking system. They didn't worry about that. They didn't worry much even about the stimulus. The stimulus was too small. And why didn't they worry about this? Because they thought that the underlying problem was a banking sector problem. And you fix the banking se sector, uh, it's in the hospital for a, a year, year, two years. And in the meanwhile, while it's in the hospital, you need some artificial support of government stimulus. But then once the banking system is fixed, you'll go back to the wonders of the economy back in 2007. Well, we're now uh, five years after the breaking of the bubble, four years after the beginning of the recession, and it's clear that that diagnosis was wrong, that unemployment remains high, the banking system is not fully fixed, but it's been largely fixed. And for the reasons I've given, there's no reason to believe that the economy is going to return uh, to full employment anytime soon. And to give you a picture of what even official sources say, uh, the CBO, the Congressional Budget Office, does not anticipate the U.S. returning to full employment until somewhere around 2018. And most economists think that that's a rosy scenario. So we are facing some severe problem. So the question is, what were those underlying problems that the bu bubble was masking? And there are five that I, I would like to talk about, but, but since they've only given me an hour rather than uh, uh, my usual filibuster of uh, several hours, I, I won't be able to talk about all of them. But uh, the, the five I would have talked about are uh, the structural transformation, inequality, uh, oil, globalization, and the buildup of global reserves. And I'm going to focus most of my remarks about the first two of these issues. Given the depth and length duration of this economic downturn, it's very natural to think back at the last severe economic downturn, the Great Depression, and to see if there were some similarities between that event and the current one. And I'm going to try to argue that, in fact, there are a great deal of similarity between uh, those two events, and that by thinking about the Great Depression, we may have some insight into the current economic trauma and some insight into what policies might address it. So if we think back into the Great Depression, it was a, a period of enormous structural transformation. The economy was moving from agriculture to manufacturing. At the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, most people were working in agriculture. Uh, you, you needed to do that to fee, produce the food that people needed to survive. But then, uh, beginning in mid-19th uh, century, but extending into the uh, uh, 20th century, there was enormous increases in productivity in agriculture. So we went from a world in which most people lived on the farms making food to a situation today where, say, in the United States, uh, only 2% of the labor force works in agriculture, and it produces more food than even an obese population can eat. So, uh, and we are our major exporters. So, so that illustrates the magnitude of the, of the transformation of our economy. Of course, as people move out of agriculture, they're not needed, they have to move somewhere else. And where they moved at that time was into manufacturing. 
Well, the suggestion, and I'll come back to it, is that we're going through a similar period of structural transformation, a transformation from manufacturing to services. And again, it's caused in a sense by our good luck, by our good, uh, by, by uh, uh, technological progress. The technological progress means that we need fewer and fewer workers in manufacturing to produce the TVs and the cars and the other things uh, that, that we consume. And so if demand for manufactured goods goes up more slowly than productivity, that means employment and manufacturing is going to go down. And that's really the basic phenomena that inevitably that from a global point of view that the growth in, in productivity has been so high that uh, employment is, is going to be diminishing in the advanced industrial countries. Uh, I come from Gary, Indiana, uh, which is a, a, a steel town. It was founded in 1906. It was a, the first integrated steel mill. And I, I recently went, went uh, back to visit uh, the, the city. Um, it's uh, 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 very dramatic because it looks like uh, a, a war zone, uh, like it was bombed out. And they actually use it for making movies about what happens in Somali because it's a little bit safer than, than, than Somali, but it looks uh, as equally devastated. Um, and uh, what's happened, of course, is that production in the steel mills is the same as it was 30 years ago, but it uses one-sixth of the labor. And since the United States doesn't believe in having government help anybody, uh, what's happened is that the city has become totally decayed, and the same thing is in Detroit and many of other, other uh, cities. Well, to go back to the Great Depression, Basically, the problem is that if labor gets trapped in this sector in which productivity is going up, but income is going down, then obviously people in that sector can't buy goods from other sectors, and it has a macroeconomic consequence. So the, the basic notion is that technical change can always induce large distributive consequences. There can be winners and there are losers. In general, the winners should be able, uh, can compensate the losers. Of course, they seldom do. Now, in analyzing this problem uh, with my colleague Bruce Greenwald at Columbia, we constructed a model where we could ignore these distributive effects and you get the result that with free mobility, all workers are better off. So technical change makes everybody better off. Um, but the essential point of our analysis is to show that with imperfect markets, in particular with imperfect mobility, those in the rural sector get trapped. Productivity is going up, prices go down, wages go down, and those in the rural sector get worse and worse off. But the problem then is that that has spillover effects on others. And the result of that is we get what we call immiserizing prog technical progress. And both sectors, both the urban and the rural sector, are worse off. So uh, there's a very simple model that we formulated. I, I'm not going to go through uh, in detail. That basically is a two-sector model where we have demand for agricultural goods equal the supply of agricultural goods and demand for urban goods equal the supply of urban goods. Um, and we ask, what happens if instead of having free mobility from the rural sector to the urban sector, uh, there is no mobility? There are frictions. And the result of that is that under plausible conditions, stability condition, an increase in agricultural productivity unambiguously yields a reduction in the relative price of agriculture, a reduction in the income of those in the agriculture sector, and a reduction in employment in manufacturing. So this is, a, in, in a sense, the, the, the important insight of the analysis. Uh, it, it, what it says is that technical progress, when you get trapped, don't have mobility, can make 
not only those trapped worse off, but the spillover effects to the other sector it makes that sector worse off. Well, the result is, as I said, an economy-wide slump. If you look at the data for the Great Depression, it seems consistent with this kind of picture. Uh, the magnitude of the decline in agriculture prices, incomes, uh, was quite extraordinary. Between 1929 and 1932, agriculture income fell by more than 50%. And remember, at that period, a quarter of the population was living in the agricultural sector or deriving its income from the agricultural sector. So this is a huge decline in, in, in income as a result of, mainly as a result of uh, increased in productivity. The result of that decline in income was that those in the agricultural sector could not easily move to the urban sector because their value of their houses was going down, their resources were going down, they didn't have the resource, and the banks were not willing, were, were having difficulties, they weren't lending, and so the resources that you needed to move weren't there, and besides, as their income went down, demand for urban goods went down, and unemployment in the urban sector, so there was neither the push nor the pull. And again, you see that in the data, while in the 1920s, while there was a more gradual decline in prices in the agriculture, there was a great deal of migration, out-migration from the rural sector. The percentage of the population in the rural sector declined from 30% to 25%. But in the 1930s, there was almost no out-migration. In fact, uh, in some places, there was re-migration into the rural sector. Now, one of the difficulties in uh, discussing uh, events like the Great Depression is that lots of things are going on at one time. And as we look back on the period, uh, everybody talks about the financial crisis, the banking crisis. And the question is, of course, what caused what? Was it the financial crisis that caused the real crisis? The real crisis caused the financial crisis. Well, it's pretty clear, the story that I just told makes it clear, it, the, the, the increase in productivity in agriculture was not caused by the financial crisis. This was a real shock to the economy. It was a real, something real going on. The banking crisis, if you look at the timing, was really a result of the weakening of the economy. When, you when an economy goes into a recession, banks get into trouble. People can't repay the loans. But of course, the weaknesses in the financial system deepen the economic downturn and perpetuate it. So the two do eventually become intertwined. Well, that leads very naturally to the question of what, 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 could, what can one do uh, to uh, help the economy recover? And the simple model that I described before provides a framework in which one can address that question. What we can show is that, in that model at least, an increase in government expenditure increases urban employment and raises agricultural prices and incomes. And what's interesting here is that even though the underlying problem is structural, that is to say this transition from uh, agriculture to manufacturing, Keynesian policies work. Of course, even more effective uh, is the case if spending is directed at the underlying structural problem, helping people move from the rural to the urban sector, giving them the skills to increase their productivity uh, in the urban sector. And that is, of course, what eventually worked in the case of the Great Depression. In the Great Depression, there's a big debate going on in the United States about what was the role of the New Deal. What was the role of the government stimulus that was associated with the, the New Deal was President Roosevelt, when, when he got a, uh, took office, uh, began a program of increased government spending, and he had some other structural pro, uh, issues, uh, 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 policies as well. And it's widely criticized because the U.S. did not really get out of the Great Depression until uh, World War II. 
But our analysis provides some interpretation of what went wrong. The first problem was that the New Deal was just not big enough, just like the stimulus of 2008 in 2009 was, not just, it was just not big enough. It wasn't big enough to offset the huge negative effects of declining farm income. And the second problem, again analogous to what's happening today in Europe and America, the New Deal was not sustained. In 1937, there was a disease that spread around uh, the United States called deficit fetishism. People started worrying about the deficit. Happened, happening now in Europe, too and in America, and what did they do in response to the worries about the deficit? They cut back in government spending. And guess what happened when they cut back in government spending? The economy went into a double dip. Sound familiar? Uh, and that, of course, is what's happening uh, in Europe today. Uh, besides, in the United States, there was another problem, and that is we have a federal system where about a third of all spending occurs at the state and local level. So when you hear budget numbers, it's at the federal level, but meanwhile, a third of what is going on in the public sector is at the state and local level. And what's been happening is the state and localities have balanced budget frameworks, the kind of thing that Merkel wants Europe to have. Well, what happens when you have a balanced budget framework? The economy goes down, revenues go down, government has to cut back, and the economy gets weaker. And so if we look at what's been happening in the United States, is that today, rather than government being counter-cyclical, supporting a weak economy, the government has actually been contributing to the weaknesses. Right now, there are nearly one million fewer people in the public sector than before the crisis. So of the millions who have lost their job, one million of those are people who've lost their job in the public sector. So rather than the public sector helping the private sector, it's exacerbating uh, the downturn. Well, what finally happened that got the US out of, out of, out of the crisis, out of the Great Depression in, in Europe as well, was uh, the war. In a sense, World War II was a massive Keynesian uh, stimulus. Of course, in terms of the, the economy, it would have been a lot better if we had spent the money on things like investments that improved productivity than, than bombs, but uh, uh, we didn't have any choice at the time, uh, and that spending did, did uh, stimulate the economy. But it did something else. It was unintentionally an industrial policy. It changed the structure of the American economy. It moved people from the rural to the urban sector. It provided them with training. Uh, it provided them with the uh, kinds of skills they needed to be an industri a skilled industrial wor uh, workforce. And then after the war, we did one more thing. We passed something called the GI Bill that guaranteed everybody who had fought in the war a college education. So it was a dramatic upskilling of the population to reflect the needs of, of, of mid-20th century. And it worked. There was one other important aspect, which was there was a lot of forced savings during the war, and this helped provide stimulus to buy the goods after the war, which is in marked contrast to the legacy of debt that uh, we all face today. Well, there are a large number of uh, theories uh, of the Great Depression, a large number of theories, uh, standard macroeconomic theories, explain uh, periods of extended unemployment. One theory that you hear, particularly from people in central banks who don't like to admit that they messed up on their monetary and regulatory policy, they like to blame labor markets. Uh, it's just one of those things. You always want to blame what somebody else did for uh, the problems. So, uh, you may have heard uh, uh, senior officials at the ECB talk about labor market rigidities as the cause of the problem. Well, in our model, we can investigate that and we can ask the question, what would have happened if we lowered urban wages? Well, in the model, it's very clear what happens. Lowering urban wages lowers agricultural prices 
and lowers urban employment. It actually makes the downturn worse. High wages are not the problem. And the reason is perfectly clear. Lowering wages would lower aggregate demand and worsen the problem. It's worth noting that in this crisis, the United States, the country with the allegedly most flexible labor market, has had much poorer job performance than many others. And that's the point I made before, that, that one out of six Americans who would like a full-time job can't get one. Uh, and and, and uh, there are a lot of other, you know, uh, now over 40 percent of, of those who are unemployed are long-term unemployed. Another hypothesis, hypothesis that uh, is sometimes put forward uh, for uh, the economic downturn, especially by those on the right, they want to blame government. Uh, you know, it's not that the banks mismanaged uh, things, it's, it's the government that was the source of the problem. And the particular uh, aspect, part of the government that, that uh, has often been blamed are monetary, is monetary policy. Milton Friedman uh, uh, made that a central part of his uh, thesis. Well, I'd argue that monetary policy was clearly not the cause of the Depression. Uh, and it is unlikely that it could have by itself reversed the downturn. In economics, we don't really uh, have the opportunity to do clean experiments on macroeconomics. We can't uh, say, let's, let's have another Great Depression, and this time, rather than uh, uh, have uh, the central bank do what it did, let's have another policy. Let's say we expand the monetary uh, money supply. So, it's very difficult to, to really test a number of hypotheses. But in a way, this recession has provided a, as good a test as you can find of, of the monetary hypothesis, because Bernanke, allegedly a student of the Great Depression, what was his response to the downturn? He, he didn't want to get the criticism that Friedman leveled against the Fed, and he started increasing the money supply. He expanded the balance sheet of the Fed from 800 uh, billion to well over two trillion dollars, very, very quickly. You know, it, there's never been a monetary expansion of that size ever in that short of span of time. And did it work? Well, it may have saved some of the banks, but it did not res resuscitate the economy. And I don't think anybody would claim that it did. So the important point, lesson from that, is that monetary policy not only wasn't the cause of the Great Depression, it's unlikely that monetary policy by itself could have reversed it. Another part of the explanation that is sometimes uh, uh, of the interpretation of the Great Depression are uh, the gold standard, monetary arrangements. Uh, again, I'd argue the gold standard didn't cause it, but gold standard, the, the, the system, the gold standard system did inhibit adjustment. When you have a big shock like that, you need to adjust. Different countries need to adjust in different ways, and the gold standard inhibited that adjustment. And we have a little bit of evidence on that, because if we look at different countries, Many of them, most of them, eventually did leave the gold standards. And the countries that left the gold standards early, like Argentina, did a lot better. Of course, that doesn't fully answer the question, because some of their gains were based on competitive devaluation, bigger than neighbor policies. They gained an advantage at the expense of others. But the big lesson from this is that in what we call internal devaluation, adjusting wages and prices. You could keep the gold standard, your fixed parity with, the, uh, with gold, and lower wages and prices. In standard economic models, that would have been fully equivalent. But internal devaluations didn't work. They were no substitute for exchange rate flexibility. It should be obvious that there are uh, direct implications for Europe because Europe has voluntarily put itself in shackles of the euro. 
And that has inhibits, that inhibits adjustment of various countries within Europe to the shock of this structural transformation and uh, with consequences that you are now experiencing. Well, let me just uh, make a, a very few asides on the relevance of standard macroeconomic models for understanding uh, 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 this downturn, uh, at least from the perspective of what uh, the structural transformation interpretation that I've just given. Since such trans structural transformations occur very seldom, it's very difficult uh, for rational expectations models to be of much help. And because the issue is structural, an aggregate model with a single sector is not going to be of much help. And since among the major effects are those arising from redistribution, a representative agent model, which is standard in most macroeconomics, uh, or was until recently, is not of much help. And since central issue entails frictions in mobility, assuming perfect markets, is not of much help. Well, that's one important aspect, I think, of, of uh, trying to understand the, the underlying problem that we face today, uh, we in the advanced industrial countries. Uh, this st structural transformation, of course, is compounded by globalization. That is to say, not only is it the case that productivity has increased and in decreasing total demand for manufacturing employment, there's a shift of the location of that employment from advanced industrial countries to uh, the emerging markets. Uh, but there's a second issue I want to talk about, which is inequality. Uh, there, uh, some of you may have followed uh, uh, the uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, demonstrations in the United States. Uh, and you may have uh, noticed that one of the slogans of the Occupy Wall Street has been, we are the 99%. Uh, you may not know it, but, but uh, 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 your uh, school has played a large role in this because the basic research on that was done by Piketty and Saez, where they pointed out that the 1% in the United States today gets between 20 and 25% of all the income and has roughly 40% of all the wealth. And uh, that is increasingly being seen as uh, outrageous. And particularly when you look at the sources of that, uh, uh, much of that inequality, um, that it is associated with rank seeking, uh, with uh, not with with innovation, uh, a real innovation, not with uh, uh, changes that have increased overall societal product productivity, but uh, rather with uh, with a variety of kinds of things like monopoly practices, uh, um, uh, uh, problems associated with corporate governance, and so forth. Uh, well, how is that relevant to our macroeconomic situation? Well, it's very relevant because one of the things that uh, uh, the data shows very clearly is that those at the top save much more than those at the bottom. I mentioned before that those at the bottom consume 110% of their income. But even in a more rational society, they consume close to 100% of their income, whereas those at the top save about 15 to 20%. Well, what does that mean? Well, when you redistribute income then from the bottom to the top, that means aggregate consumption goes down. Total demand for goods and services go down because the savings rate goes up. Well, that would have resulted in a weak economy. As I said, it, it, it would have resulted in a weak economy if we hadn't done anything, something about it. And in their wisdom, our central bank figured out an answer. What we said was, we told Americans, don't let the fact that your income is going down bother you. Continue to spend as if your income was going up. 
and Americans uh, are, uh, excel in spending and consuming. They did that really, really well. Uh, the magnitude of the decline, the weaknesses, uh, you know, I, I talked about what was happening at the 1%, the people at the top were getting wealthier. It was largely at the expense of the rest of society. Median income, the people in the middle, and the median household income today in the United States is comparable to what it was 15 years ago. But even worse is what's been happening, that income is there only because people are working more. They work longer hours, they work harder, more people in every household are working. Um, sometimes people contrast that with France, uh, where, where uh, you excel in leisure. Um, at least in the standard models. But anyway, the, 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 uh, if you look at the data on the income of a full-time male worker, his income today is the same as it was a third of a century ago. So there's been stagnation in incomes for a third of a century. So whatever the wonders of capitalism and the growth that has occurred, it hasn't benefited most workers. All the benefits have gone to the people at the top. Next is something about our market economy. Well, to go back to what I, to the theme, uh, what we said to these workers whose income was going down, spend your income as if your, spend as if your income was going up. Well, how do you, how do you square that circle? How do you continue to spend if your income is going down how do you spend as if your income is going up? There's only one way you can do that, and that's borrowing. And our banks obliged, and they lent uh, in, a, in, in a very irresponsible way. Well, the interesting thing is that today, as we go into uh, the fifth year of, of our recession, the problem is getting exacerbated. The, and that is providing part of the motivation for the Occupy Wall Street movement. What they see is the, 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 the salaries at the top have continued to do well, but because of the high unemployment, wages in the middle and wages at the bottom are going down, adjusted for inflation, and so inequality is increasing, and that is uh, contributing to the weakness uh, in our economy. I should point out that there were alternative policies for addressing the deficiency in aggregate demand arising from this increasing inequality. Uh, one could have, for instance, have had increased government spending uh, on education, a whole variety of other uh, uh, needs. We could have had uh, more progressive taxation. But the political economy, which is associated with the increasing inequality in the United States, make such an alternative unacceptable. So that, um, particularly in the United States, where uh, a recent Supreme Court decision has said that corporations are people, it's an interesting concept, um, and that therefore, because corporations are people, they should have unlimited rights to spend money on campaign contra uh, in campaigns to try to shape uh, the elections. And so, uh, 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 as some people say, we're, we're, we're increasingly becoming uh, a, a democracy, which is the best democracy that money can buy. So um, uh, what we did in, uh, under President Bush was to have a tax cut for the upper income Americans, which exacerbated the problems, putting the increased burden on, uh, on, on a bubble and a debt for sustaining the economy before the crisis. Well. Uh, 